This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. So as you guys know, cross-site scripting has been a big deal for a long time. But finally, we're seeing some really interesting new things with it here. Join me at uh, DerbyCon 2011. Koss, how are you, man? I'm great, thank you. So what is the the new cross-site scripting stuff that you're showing off here? So generally, cross-site scripting is a browser-based attack. It's it's specific to the website that you're attacking and, and sometimes even specific to that browser. Um, it doesn't really give you much more access than that, either that website or maybe a browser attack. But uh, nowadays, with uh, such dynamic applications, a lot of developers are kind of taking the easy way out and embedding JavaScript engines and HTML engines inside of applications, uh, desktop applications. Well, I mean, isn't that like the future? It's like, oh, just develop it for the web. You know, HTML5, it's the future. You just in integrate that into your, web, uh, into your application. I can see how it's, it's easier for a developer to get something out rapidly. Oh yeah, it's it's a great. I mean, it, it, HTML and JavaScript were meant for user interfaces. That's it, that was the whole thing behind them. Like they're meant to be facing you know a, a user and and make it easy for that user. And they are also meant to be, you know, damn cheap to to develop and and easy to roll out. Uh, the unfortunate thing though is that there's not a whole lot of uh, all, all the security stuff is mostly server side. We, we haven't really gotten to a point where developers are being taught client side filtering of uh, content. So what are some of the applications that are actually not filtering properly locally and, and getting owned? So in my talk I actually demoed five different applications. Um, I demoed two on uh, OS X, uh, Skype, uh, a later version of Skype which was found vulnerable a few months back. Um, and then ADM, which was very recently just found vulnerable about a month ago. And neither of those have been patched? Uh, Skype was patched after about a month or two of the discovery. ADM was patched three weeks after the discovery. But neither of them had uh, been made aware of the actual security implications because the original finders uh, saw XSS and they kind of just posted, oh, hey, look, XSS, I can, you know, put a phishing page inside of your ADM or chat. Or just, just pop up the the alert, hello world? Exactly. Um, I wasn't really too happy with that. I thought I would make it a lot more fun. So, so what, you've got like an advanced payload or something? So my, my payload is actually, um, it's it's not too bad advanced. Actually, everybody uses it nowadays. It's um, a simple XML HTTP request, which is basically uh, the fundamentals of AJAX queries and you know asynchronous websites, so you don't have to change pages or reload. Yeah. The only thing I'm doing differently here is instead of making a request for a web page, I'm making a request for a file on your local file system. Oh, on your local file system because you you are an application. So, so what, like file colon slash slash? Exactly, because you're an application, and in some cases you're running in the file colon slash slash user space. You're totally the the application is totally allowed to access whatever it wants. So, like on a Mac with uh, that version of Skype, you do the cross site scripting. What kind of files on the hard drive would you particularly be looking for? So with any sort of post exploitation, um, we always go after kind of the really juicy, sensitive files first. So I usually, I actually um, wrote a tool for this to automate this, and in the list I have uh, such files as uh, SSH keys, SSH hosts, uh, your cookie files, your uh, key ring, so I can brute force it offline. Um, anything that has any sort of credential information or any sort of logs that'll point me to, you know, something a little bit more sensitive or juicy. Nice, and since you know that where those are, so so those are the two applications on uh, OS 10. Now, what what are some of the other applications? So uh, I, I actually from OS 10, I, I went and I had at, um, looked at Skype on iOS. Uh, it was actually a funny story. We were testing out the the Skype bug on OS X. Uh, me and my coworker, and he looks down at his phone and he goes, oh, I just got a message on Skype. And it was himself because we were testing it. He opens it up and he suddenly got an alert box on his iPhone. Uh, and, and we discovered that the iPhone was also vulnerable to uh, almost the same XSS. Uh, and so along with the iPhone. But, but with the iPhone, though, it's not like the same kind of port where you can just be like file colon slash slash Etsy password. It's like, you know, Skype on the iPhone can't see those directories. Right, so the way the mobile applications uh, are developed is quite a bit different than uh, desktop. And actually a little bit more sane, really. Yeah, having, having multiple users per uh, application and having permission levels set per application on folders and files is 
a much better way of uh, you know preventing rogue applications from accessing stuff like like they would be able to on the desktop. Right, because there is no reason that your Skype application on your smartphone needs any of the data from your email. Exactly, exactly. So, so in that case, we are limited to Skype, you know, specific things. Or uh, as my coworker put in his blog post. Um, he actually pulled down the address book uh, of the user, so. Well, yeah, because they do. Uh, we say, oh, well, you don't need your their email account, but a lot of times you will find that they are, um, you know, integrating with the the contact list. Absolutely, but but a lot of we. I mean, I would I would assume that there'd be some sort of API for them to interact with and not interact directly with the file itself, but you know, it makes it easier for us that we can just you know zip up a, a SQLite file, send it off to my server, and then I have your SQLite address book. Right, so how about anything for Android? Yeah, so um, Android, I actually recently discovered this. Um, there's a bug in the Gmail application which will actually allow uh, an attacker to inject code in the uh, from uh, header of the email. Uh, so basically, you, as an attacker, you would inject your payload in the from header of an email. The user would receive that email. Uh, you would click sh uh, show more details on the application, and it would render all the HTML. Okay, so but you need to be able to malform your from field. So it's not like you're going to be able to start sending this attack from a Gmail account or something, or, or at least from the Gmail interface. Right, you need some sort of, you know, roll your own script, or in the case of what I was doing, actually, uh, I took maps.google.com, and I, uh, I started sending myself links to different locations using the send functionality, and it didn't verify the sanity of the email address or the, the name that it was going to. But doesn't it come from, like, some weird string at maps.google.com? Right, but it uh, oftentimes it'll, it, it does that, but it'll also say your friend shared you a location, Yosemite, and then you can go ahead and open up the email and hit the, the show details and uh, it'll pop. Nice. Well, sounds a little easier than like teleneting to port 25 and doing it that way. Yeah, you could definitely do it through an open relay, but uh, I kind of thought it was a little fun to uh, take advantage of an exploit using uh, uh, an app like Maps. You're using a Google service to take advantage of a Google app. So what now do you have access to? You've gotten some JavaScript to run in the uh, in the Gmail application, so what now? So because I'm running in the Gmail application, I don't have access to too much on the f file system that other sensitive apps have. Um, but I do, however, have access to everything that the Gmail app has access to, which uh, the, the juiciest part of that is uh, your local offline storage in Gmail. It's all stored locally in a, a databases file uh, for each G Gmail uh, account that you have. And I can just go ahead and make a request for that and pull that down without it, you know, without complaint. Now, is there a way to like pivot from that application to like other applications? So I'm actually working on a, a secondary, more complex attack, which includes um, sending the user an HTML file uh, as an attachment, and then from that, um, from the interface in Gmail, because I can inject JavaScript, I can just have JavaScript automatically download that HTML file, and then I can spawn a browser session using JavaScript again to navigate directly to that HTML file. Oh, oh! now you're in the browser? Now I'm in the browser. So because I'm in the browser, now I have access to all your cookies. I have access to your web history. I love it. Yeah. So the only human interaction at this point, though, is that you've got to get the user to click more details. So maybe some sort of phishing thing where you entice them? Yeah, I mean, it might be easy to ha just have a list of people um, or, you know, say that there's a list of people. Like, click show more details, you know, and contact this person. Their email's right there or something along the lines of that. Yeah. I mean, as... As unlikely as it sounds, I'm sure many of us have done phishing attacks and we know how, you know, a, a percentage of that gets through and if even a small percentage of it gets through, I mean, I still have all their emails and potentially all their uh, browser information. There you go, work, work your way up the chain. Cause that is really fascinating. Uh, I know that you're also talking about this at, uh, at Torcon, so people will be able to go and bug you there. Um, is there a place where they can uh, go find blog posts, details, stuff like that? Yeah, um, I actually have the domain cause.io, K-O-S.io, and um, you'll find a link there to my blog, and I, 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 I try to keep it updated with my tour co or my uh, convention talks and all that. Um, I should have a blog post up pretty soon about the attacks that I've been talking about, and I'll have my slides up uh, and available. 
right, great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys, we are going to be back next week with even more from DerbyCon. Until then, we still have some of your emails. I know that I have like a thousand on red, but no, we, uh, we, we comb through the feedback at hack5.org to find uh, your best questions, and we go ahead and like to answer them here on the show. So let's go ahead and start it off, Janet. The first one comes from Tech Drudge. He says, I'm the de facto network admin for four households. I know how that All goes. of the wireless, yeah, me too. <laughs> All of the wireless routers use WPA2 encryption, but unfortunately, some of the passwords are very simple. Even though I am the admin and deal with all of the network issues, I have a hard time convincing the heads of households, aka my father-in-law, to use more complicated passwords. He told me nobody will be able to guess his password, but half of his password is his SSID. I was hoping you could direct me to a brute force password cracker so that I can show him why he needs to change it. Uh, we've talked yeah. about brute force <laughs> password cracking WPA keys. I can probably link in the show notes to some previous episodes on Hack 5. I think it was like season 7 when we did that. Otherwise, uh, th another easy thing to do is show them like a uh, brute force calculator. Uh, there's one over at lastbits.com. This is pretty easy. We just say, okay, password length, eight characters, our standard, I don't know, 50,000 passwords per second. Sure, why not? It says it'll take up to five days, and that's just with lowercase. Oh, wow. And then as you get more complicated,